Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I'll start with a statement that you've all heard before. Eating green vegetables is healthy for you. Nothing new there. But what is new is we make new discoveries every day in terms of the mechanism of action, what these vegetables do in our body that actually is protective for health. So I came across this study that I um, think is interesting about the effect of green vegetables on the health of your gastrointestinal tract. And there are lots of reasons to pay attention to GI health because this affects your immune function and your ability to absorb nutrients from food and all kinds of different stuff. So, innate lymphoid cells, which we'll call ILCs, are located in the lining of the GI tract. And in addition to protecting the body from pathogenic bacteria, very important, they contribute to controlling in, uh, allergies and inflammation and can even have anti-cancer properties. According to recent research, a gene called TBET helps in the production of these ILCs, and the gene is influenced by the foods that we eat, particularly when we eat green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables, because they contain proteins that interact with a cell surface receptor that switches on the gene. The researchers stated that in the absence of this gene, the body becomes more susceptible to bacterial infections, particularly those that enter the body through the intestines. The cells lining the intestine provide a very important barrier that keeps pathogenic bacteria out, but provides the ability to absorb nutrients from foods. Now, in addition to serving as an important part of this barrier system, these ILCs I referred to earlier assist in healing small wounds and lesions that can be precursors to everything from inflammatory bowel disease to diseases like Crohn's and even cancer. So those are just some reasons why, to, you know that the leafy green vegetables and cruciferous vegetables are good for you, but these are some reasons why they're good for you. So my rules, what I try to get everybody that I talk to to do is to eat a couple of nice big green salads every day, one with lunch and one with dinner, and then try to have as many green vegetable dishes as you can, foods like Brussels sprouts and asparagus and, and um, broccoli, uh, Swiss chard. I mean, there are so many of them. And kale, of course. And here's a, a, an interesting thing I heard recently that kale is now the most popular vegetable in the United States which is wonderful since french fries usually are at the top of the list we're making progress kale's gaining ground on french fries but uh, if you don't like kale try mustard greens and turnip greens and and just eat a wide variety of these green foods they're good for you and again we we have almost universal agreement on that we don't spend a lot of time arguing over whether or not green vegetables are good for you all right, so on to a more serious topic. I've spent a lot of time over the years talking uh, to women and putting information out on these broadcasts about the dangers of mammography. And uh, men are not immune to harmful advice concerning diagnostic testing, and um, particularly as it pertains to PSA testing. So a new analysis presented by a Dr. Mathieu Bagnol to the European Cancer Conference 2013 shows that routine screening via PSA testing for men does more harm than good. This is not new information, by the way. Uh, the US Preventive Services Task Force two or three years ago issued a report recommending against routine PSA testing for all men. But um, this advice is largely ignored by doctors, and so many men have been brainwashed to think that PSA testing is good for them, just like women have been brainwashed to think that mammography is going to save their lives. So um, of, some of the information cited included data from France, where 55% of the men between the ages of 55 and 60 are tested, and 80% of the men 65 years of age or older had been tested during the previous three years. Now, in the 1980s, before routine screening was routine, the incidence of uh, prostate cancer in, in France was 5%, the death rate was 2%. Today, the incidence is 14%, but the death rate is still 2%. So we're catching lots more cancers. We just haven't changed at all the mortality rate from prostate cancer. And um, so this means that we're treating a lot of men, uh, but the treatment isn't really helping to save their lives. And the problem with prostate treatment is that uh, a lot of the treatments leave men incontinent and impotent, very negatively life-altering without saving their lives. Um, the doctor and his colleagues estimated the total harm that men would endure. Like if you take a thousand men, it takes a thousand men getting tested to save one man's life. 
And out of those 1,000 men, we'd have 154 biopsies that were not helpful. There would be um, uh, nine of those biopsies would end up uh, resulting in hospitalization for adverse side effects. That's a little bit scary. Twelve additional cases of infidence, two cases of incontinence, and one case of fecal incontinence. And we, remember, we're not changing the death rate from prostate cancer at all. Additionally, the authors reported that 18% of cancer-related surgery was performed on men older than 70. These are the men who are likely to die with prostate cancer, but not of it. And uh, furthermore, 183 deaths occurred 60 days after prostate cancer surgery. I mean, these are people that we should not be performing surgery on. So men are faced with the same issue regarding PSA testing that women are faced with with mammograms. Um, the test can't separate small, harmless growths from aggressive tumors, but we treat all patients with a diagnosis as if they have cancer. And again, the treatments for men are negatively life-altering and they don't save lives. So uh, one professor of epidemiology was commenting on this whole thing in the article that I read on it. And he said, one of the real challenges, and in my mind, the major challenge that has to be resolved before we can embrace screening is we have to separate indolent or harmless from aggressive cancers. Um, we need new markers. In countries like the U.S. where screening is done routinely, the incidence is almost eightfold higher than mortality. So if you have uh, prostate cancer, little chance of dying of it, but a big chance you're going to be harmed by the treatment. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing here is teaching men and women, everybody, to learn to just say no. Sometimes I think the best thing to do is say no about going to the doctor, but if you are going to go there, learn to just say no when these types of recommendations are made to you. All right, that's all for now and for the week. As usual, have a wonderful weekend and feel free to pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will talk to you again next Tuesday.